Hello, my name's Gavin Bottrell. My website's hickorygolf.co.uk. My company's Time Warp Golf. Um, I've been collecting and uh, trading in antique golf clubs for about over well over 20 years since about 1997 I started collecting and then a, a few years after that I started buying and selling um, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about some early irons and to give a few tips on what to look for and I have to say um, it, it's always been a great thrill of mine to find a bag of old corroded irons that really don't look very much and so this sort of thing where a lot of people would probably pass them by because they don't look nice and shiny um, and I've always really got a lot of pleasure out of taking an old iron and, and cleaning it up and I'll come on to that in a minute and um, finding out who made it. It's not always possible to actually determine who the maker is but um, I'd say in quite a high percentage of, of cases um, there's little telltale signs and I'll just talk about one or two uh, of those to look out for. So, okay, so say if you have um, an old iron that looks pretty brown, um, but this is what I'd say is relatively smooth corrosion. Um, let's see if I can quickly grab one that is a lot worse condition. Mm, don't think I have one to hand. Um, sometimes they come, aha, here's one. I shall just try and lift up <laughs> and show to the camera. Um, that's probably quite bad condition. Um, but actually I think you can still almost make out a name on that one. But uh, the condition I, I, I really like to find them in is where the, the rust is brown and it's smooth, what I'd call smooth, so not really any big pitting marks. Um, that's one thing that uh, if you see uh, an old iron and it's got lots of deep pits, then that's very hard to, to really clean it up to an, a nice stage, um, a nice state rather. It's not impossible, but um, you, you're taking a lot of the metal off to do that. So. One thing I would recommend, and um, I get uh, asked this quite a fair bit, and you see questions on social media saying, well, how do people clean up their irons? Um, I think the best way by far, particularly if you're not that experienced in this, is to get yourself some very fine sandpaper, what we in the UK typically call emery paper. So I don't know what grit that is, um, it's probably in the range of about 280, 300 plus, something like that. Um, and it comes typically, the best stuff to get is cloth backed. This is cloth backed rather than paper backed. Paper back, which is, this is what we call wet and dry, typically used by people who would, um, and, uh, I remember doing this a couple of decades ago when you would be filling in the holes on your car bodywork you would use various grades of uh, wet and dry but this is very much paper backed sandpaper and um, just absolutely rips as easy as that so that's good when you're doing something very flat or over a large area and you can wrap the paper around the, um, a cork block something like that but so when you're doing clubs, you, the best thing is to get this um, cloth-backed paper. Um, this has gone orange because the, the thing that you can do with this is, and really is the, the thing I recommend, is um, you need a bit of water. Now, whether you get water out your tap or, um, or you, put, it, you um, put water on the cloth by other means, let's say, um, I guess uh, caddies of old would um, a bit of um, spit from the mouth and anyway this uh, it's just a case then of when you have an, an, an iron that needs cleaning and let's see this one for example okay I'll show you so it's got general corrosion um, I guess on most of it um, okay so 
going to get a little bit of um, spit and um, onto the club itself and then go at it with this. This is a very dirty job. Um, I recommend that um, you might want to invest in some simple plastic gloves. I tend to get through boxes and boxes of these. What are these? Vinyl. I think you can use um, uh, well, you get latex free ones and stuff like this. So anyway, it's handy to have on a set of disposable gloves because it is an absolute filthy job. And then a little bit of moisture onto the club head. And then it's a case of simply going at it and giving it a clean and the, the good thing about this method is all you're doing is replicating what caddies of um, previous centuries would have done to clean clubs irons after every round so you, you can't it's very difficult to ruin an iron but clearly if you've got something that you think is really, really old, and I'm talking sort of feather ball era, pre-1850, then you might want to seek some uh, extra advice before you even do this operation. But this iron I've got in my hand, I would say this is probably 1890, uh, something like that. And um, let's just give it a little clean and just see if there is any maker's marks. Now, the, the, the whole, uh, as many golf collectors know, why a lot of irons don't have marks is because of what I'm doing now. Uh, the caddies would clean the club and gradually the, the maker's marks, the stampings, would have got worn away. And so, okay, given that uh, just a, a minute or so, and it sort of builds up a nice fine slurry of, of almost grinding paste. Okay, so let's see if there is anything on here. Now, um, I can see a few little letters down the bottom and also it, it's almost imperceptible but there is some letters here in a sort of oval. And I've got a little uh, eyeglass, which I often use. So a jeweler's loop, I think you, you'd call these. What they are, 20, this is a 10 times magnification. You can get them 20 and even 40 times. I'll just have a look and see if I can see anything that makes sense. And the answer is no, I can't. <laughs> so I don't know um, who made that head and that uh, can happen. But what I wanted to particularly say today is there's certain marks that um, it's good to look out for. Now, so for example, let me see if I can find it. Right. This iron here, it's got a nice sharp crease between the top of the blade and the hosel. And you might read, and I've got nothing to dispel it, that says that generally is pre-1885. Um, I'm not exactly sure as to whether that date is spot on for every single maker. But certainly, when you see that, it's a good sign that it's an early iron. Okay, now the thing I was wanting to point out, if I can just get this camera to pick this up, and I'm not sure I can do it, is there is a very, very faint... Oh, I'll try and persevere here a minute. Right, just there at the top of my tip of my finger, there is a circle of small letters, and 
don't necessarily want to alter the focus on the camera. Right, but anyway, you might have to take my word for it. But just there is a small circle of letters that spell Anderson of Anster, which is spelt Anstruther, but I'm reliably informed it's pronounced Anster. So anyway, Anderson of uh, Ansters were originally, I think, a, um, a tool making company who then in the about the 1860s they moved into making a few golf clubs and their mark uh, as you will read in the a lot of well, some reference books is uh, initially was a, a half inch circle um, an actual circle and then in the middle of the circle you'd see Anderson Anster that uh, stamp is is very commonly um, very faint and um, whether that's how they you know they didn't put a lot of force when they were actually stamping it but it's not um, well it's quite common that you'll pick up an old iron and if you look just about in the center of the head just there if there's no other marks at all you can you can sometimes and I've done this actually probably a few dozen times you can see the tiny A and the tiny N and the tiny D or bits of it and you say okay well that's uh, Anderson of uh, Anster and um, at least you can know who, who made it and that's what we're aiming to do here. The other one mark that is often uh, partial in that um, there's sometimes very little left of it is F H Airs who were a shop in London. So there you can see F H Airs in block writing. C for clique. You sometimes see L for lofter or M for mashy. Um, but it's it's actually not that common to get it so clear as this stamp. Sometimes you can only see a little bit of the F or the top of the H um, and, that, and that might just be it. But again, it at least it allows you to, with a high degree of certainty, say who, who made it. Um, other marks to look out for, which are always pleasing to find, are Willie Park. Um, now I'm not absolutely fully up on, um, and I know some people are, they could say well that mark is Willie Senior and then by the time Willie Junior starts making and stamping clubs the mark has slightly changed. One thing um, I do uh, or have read is that particularly where you get W Park, Maker, Musselburgh in three straight lines I think that's Willie Senior. But anyway, um, this club is um, a nice club and you can see here it's got some lettering in the centre and what I can actually read is or see is the top of the P, the top of the A, the top of the R and the top of the K going along the top and then underneath <laughs> Usselba, <laughs> which is absolutely no doubt Musselburgh. So, yeah, um, a nice uh, Park Musselburgh iron, and um, it's actually this iron has a little bit of concavity on the face, but I'm not sure whether this is actually um, a patent concave face lofter. I don't think so because I've, I've had one or two of those in the past and they are quite actually dished. This is a bit more straight faced. Okay um, so what else? Um, often you will see irons and like this where it would have started out smooth faced. Um, this one actually is George Nickel of Leven. Um, 
Let's see if I can just put that there. You can see G Nickel of Leven. It's got one of his earlier hand marks here. Just sort of like an outline of the hand. But this club, so eight, very late 1890s, early 1900s, um, would have started out, I have no doubt, smooth-faced. And then it's had uh, a pattern of dots hand applied to it, which gives it a lot of character. And that club, and that, another thing, interesting thing is, is sometimes when you've found a bag or a batch of clubs, um, you can actually, with pretty high um, confidence, say, well, th they were probably part of the same set. So this club is stamped Jack White Sunningdale, but um, it was found actually together with this nickel. But what almost confirmed it for me was it's not exactly the same stamping. In fact, these dots are quite spaced out, as you can see. But again, this would have started smooth face. And then at some time, the original owner has said, well, I'm, you know, um, I want to have some pattern on there to help with backspin. So, you know, whether these irons have been done at the same time or, or not, but what I'm saying is I'm, I'm absolutely certain that these did belong to the same player. And yeah, one's Jack White and one's George Nicol. So that's the other thing is in them times people would be um, acquiring clubs from different makers, different sources, and they would have what I, I call a mongrel set. It's not necessarily all, all Nichols or, or all Andersons. Um, they would just uh, basically build up a set however they felt. Another common things to look out for on early irons and this is actually a putter is um, so it's quite dark with age but here there is a big letter P for putter. Now even if I didn't see any other marks on this club um, I could say with um, certainty that this is by uh, the Army and Navy Cooperative Stores Limited ANCSL which it is um, haven't had a good look but uh, would have been stamped on there as well the things about army and navy clubs they were almost always stamped as well ANCSL and I can just see that there on the shaft um, I don't know why and perhaps somebody out there might know but a lot of ANCSL clubs have very dark stained shafts um, and thinking about it one little idea might be that they were trying to uh, suggest that their clubs were a bit of a higher quality than they were and why I say that is because um, I've found quite a lot of early iron headed clubs by them and the shafts it's not uncommon for their shafts to be quite warped so maybe that meant that they were actually using um, wood that really wasn't quite uh, seasoned for long enough and so maybe they um, they also put a darker stains on them to try and sort of suggest that they were a bit higher quality wood i don't know just a little idea so uh, what other things if i just pick one now i've got here on the bench um, just tilt the camera I've got about mm, getting on for 20 early irons clubs that I've just been working on. So these are all what I would call really gutter ball era. So that's uh, anything from, I mean, as a lot of people know, the Haskell ball came in in 1899, the wound ball. But uh, people kept playing with the gutty balls for. I would think probably up until about 1905. So anything before 1905, yeah, I think you could legitimately say was gutty ball era. Um, if you've got a different thoughts on that, um, th that might be also valid. But anyway, so let's see what else we've got here. 
So there is another Army and Navy club. It's very nicely stamped on the shaft. You can see it there, ANCSL. Um, and what do we have on this one? Ooh, well, I can actually see A and, so the ampersand symbol, A ampersand N C S L in block letters. But again, it's very, very faint, but it's definitely there. So this is a lofter. And in fact, I can just see in the top corner there, the remnants of a big L. So, a lofter. This has a lovely big sheepskin grip on it that, um, is it the absolute original one that it was sold with? I don't know, but I think it could be because it's just, um, it speaks to me that, um, it's, you know, late 1890s, early 1900s. Huge grip that you grip very much with a palm, two-handed palm grip. Okay, what else do we have? Um, what's that? So that's got a little oh, um, Robert Condy, little rose mark there, and uh, Hepburn of Royston. Now I've had a few clubs lately of Hepburn of Royston, in fact I found a batch of them and uh, when I looked up Hepburn the years he was active I think it said that uh, he started about 1905 but actually several of the clubs I've found um, they suggest to me that he, he could have been active a few years earlier than that. So. What else do we have? Um, okay, so I was talking about airs earlier. So this is a lofter with quite a large blade. There's no sharp crease here. It's very much a, a curve, but the hosel is extremely thick um, compared with other irons and certainly 1920 iron it's probably about 50 percent um, more than a 1920 iron and so there's no nothing evident on the head but if we come across across the shaft and there FH airs there we are and again, what's happened to this is the grip is a big, thick grip. Um, but then it's like um, plumber's tape or handlebar tape, uh, if you remember that on your bike a long time ago, has been wound over the top. And I've seen this a lot over the years. And I, I've no doubt that if I was to remove that black tape underneath, there'd be the sheepskin grip with the underlisting under it as well but um, in doing that I'm probably going to pull off all the brown sheepskin bit so anyway just going to leave that for now but the thing about this club um, and I was actually just mentioning this to somebody yesterday is whilst the, the shaft is straight um, and, and looks really good um, as soon as you put any pressure onto it it bends hugely now again um, I think that certain club manufacturers uh, perhaps they were using wood that just wasn't properly seasoned or as stiff as it could be but yeah it's it's a bit like handling a live snake this one um, <laughs> try and give it a little waggle and um, yeah a lot of movement on that one so I might hit that one sometime and just see how it feels. Okay, well, that's about it for now. Um, <laughs> I've got two irons here, which uh, I have hit a ball with, and these are Anderson uh, irons. Uh, they've got tiny little remnants of the Anderson mark, but um, what made me smile was 
they've also got stamped with the initials of the original owner, who was T.W. So, um, hmm. just wondered if uh, there was a Tiger Woods around in the uh, latter years of the um, 19th century. Anyway, so um, that's about it from me. I hope you got some enjoyment. Oh, just one more. And I think I'm right in saying, might not be, but um, yeah, one thing to look out for is the Forgan and Sons stamp uh, that you can often see just below the grip. And I thought this was, and um, I can't just put my eye on it. Um, but again, nothing really on the head to tell you who it is, but uh, if it's got a shaft stamp, it's not always, but it's a good clue as to who might have made the head. Willy Park tended to, or certainly that company tended to stamp um, all of its shafts. And sometimes what you need to do is uh, look under this bit of the, the grip. Um, in fact, I was handling one earlier. Let's see if I can quickly find it. Ah, there we are. So, there's very little, nothing left in terms of stampings on the head, but the way that this iron um, is shaped with very low profile and a sort of round back, I thought, aha, I knew what I was looking for, which was a Willy Park stamp. And indeed, again, it's very, very slight, but, and, and, and I really don't think the camera would stand a chance of picking it up. But then I found the R and the K just appearing out from the binding. And um, so that is a Willy Park patent driving iron. And um, I've seen a few of them over the years, so they all have this head shape. So I knew what I was looking for, but um, it was good confirmation at least to, to find the R and the K. And know it for certain. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you have any comments, please put them in the box below. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please press the subscribe button. And uh, thank you for watching. Bye for now.